Father, we just bless your name. We thank you for your presence. We acknowledge you, God, that you are king and ruler over our lives, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you are here to minister to us, to touch us, to reveal new things to us. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you, Lord, that you are a good God, that your goodness never changes, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We thank you, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We may all be seated at this time. Um, we, I have uh, spoken a few weeks ago that on the first Sunday of October and also the, first, uh, the second Sunday of November, together with the first Sunday of December, we will be focusing our attention on small groups in the church. So that's for next week. Please be excited about that. I'm sure that there's more things that uh, uh, we will be doing regarding this, creating new small groups, doing a survey, and also doing more trainings. Uh, last time we met with the small group committee, we said every Saturday in October, we will meet to do training. Amen. And I'm so excited for that. I'm sure those who are part of this are also super excited about it. Amen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. This morning, we're going to be continuing our sermon series entitled, Living Out Practical Christianity in the 21st Century. Last week, we learned about uh, reaching out, going out to other people by exemplifying Christ's personality and His character. At the first Sunday, we looked at going in. We understood what it was to to model Christ inside us, to have our lives modeled after Christ. And this morning, we will be looking at this message entitled, The Bible and the Christian. Amen? The Bible and the Christian. Now, it is very important that we understand, church, in the 21st century, that the Bible is still the top priority of those who are Christian. Can you say amen? Amen. It is of vital importance that we as a Bible-believing church, a Bible-believing Christian, that we consider the final authority of faith and practice in God's Word. Amen. I am needing a volunteer to come and help me here. Anyone wants to come? No one wants to help? Everybody scared? And, oh, here's Brother John. Brother John, thank you so much for coming. Amen. Whoop. We got a static electricity up here in front. Let's consider this chocolate, Yahoo chocolate, as your life. Okay? Sometimes we're sweet in the inside, right? Sometimes. Not all the time. We mix the... Sorry, Brother John. I think I spilled some in your shirt. Just a little bit. This is our lives, right? But here is the Bible, which is, uh, I'm just giving an illustration here. This is not really the Bible. Let's say it's an energy drink, Red Bull. How many of us need energy in our daily walk with God? We need energy in our daily walk with God. You know what the source of energy is in the Christian life? It is the Bible. It is His Word. So we put high priority in God and His Word. Amen? So I'm going to open this up and just pour a little bit in. And we are going to watch. Thank you, Brother John. You can bring this with you and also the sister. We're going to watch this through this message, how the Bible affects your life. Amen? Are you excited? Amen. God is our energy through His Word. Amen? We are able to withstand every trial and everything that comes along our way through His Word. The Bible and the Christian. Hallelujah. Here's the passage we will be reading this morning. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 to verse number 16. Only three passages, three verses. And we also thank God continually because when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, that's what the Bible says, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God. Amen. 
which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things that the churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they also heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. God and His Word, the Christian, the Bible, and the Christian. Amen. I want to share with you that, uh, that in 2009... When I took the call of becoming the senior pastor of this church, one of the things that we wanted to see is to have a vision statement that relates to what we believe in. Are you with me, church? So we made some adjustments. One of the things in 2009 and 2010 that we were talking about is changing the name of the church to include what we believe is God's plan an international congregation, but we also looked at our vision and our mission. Together with some leaders during that time, we met and discussed what our mission and what our vision would look like. One of it is this. Vision statement, in order to accomplish our mission, we are to pursue a family of believers wherein every member of His church is connected to God by worship and his word. We said that if there's going to be something that we're going to be known for, we're going to be known for worship and God's word. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. Many things have changed in 10 years. For those pioneers who were there, even those who were before, they could say that it is a different time today. During that time, we were in Jones Road. Today, we're in a brand new facility. During that time, the loss of the government has changed. Things have been implemented. New, new rules that are, are established today. In fact, some of them are against God's word. Things have changed. But one thing we as Faith International has made a commitment to is this. We will not compromise the teaching of God's word. Can you say amen to that? Praise the Lord. We have such a great, tremendous worship team here in FIF. Praise God for our music pastor, Pastor Tata. Because this is something that we put priority on. God, the worship of God, and the teaching of God's word. It is uncompromised. It will not change no matter what laws come about, no matter what people will say, no matter what the community says. We are still going to be a Bible-based church. We will be a church that believes that the Christian and the Bible go together. We believe that there is no social issue that changes the integrity of God's Word. We don't consider anything of that. We believe that the teaching that is founded in this Bible has not changed from the very beginning in the past 10 years and even to today. It has not changed. What are we known for? We are known to be a Bible-believing church. Hallelujah. That's very important, friends. Because when we first received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you recall, we were taught the basics. Read the Bible. You remember? Amen? We pray. When we wake up, when we go to sleep, we pray. And thirdly, they would say, find a community of believers that you can join together with. Amen? Those are the basics of the Christian faith. The basics of how when we first got saved, that was the instructions of our mentors, of those who reached out to us. They said, read your Bible and pray every day. And they would say, come, look for a church. And we consider that as the core value of what a believer is. 
Many times what happens through life is this. We get so complicated with different things, whether it's ministry, activities, whatever things we do. We forget the basics of Christianity, which is opening our Bibles, which is praying every day and fellowshipping with a fellow brother. Are you with me, church? So we need to understand and go back to the very foundation of God's word. Because this is what we consider as final authority of faith and practice. And let me say, even in the 21st century, when this book is not popular anymore, when other ideologies are now forefront and the conservative Christian view is not. I want to challenge each one of us to hold on to God and His Word in our daily lives. Amen. To go back to where it all started when we first received Jesus, that we were so excited that the Word was given to us. Return back to that. Three things that we can look at in this message this morning. The first one is this, that we are to trust in the Bible. To trust in the Bible means to accept its authority over our lives. Do you know, church, that this book, the Bible, is God's word? And since it is God's word, he wants to speak to us. And he wants for us to be able to receive and grasp and listen and accept his word as truth. The Bible says, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. That's what's known as faith. Can you be with me, church, this morning? Can you say amen to that? You now, there are some people who would say, Can I, I want to see first in order for me to believe. God doesn't work that way. God wants us to believe by faith. If we see first, it's not anymore by faith. It's by sight. Therefore, God's word is not to be compared with something that we can prove, even though we can do that archaeologically, uh, uh, histories of the past, even uh, different historical books that support it. Yes, but God wants you to have faith in His Word. It's a book of faith. God wants us to trust His Word by faith. Amen? And He wants us to accept its authority over our lives. Let me challenge you, friends, that when we read the Bible, it is different than the newspapers that we read. It is different than any other book that you read, any other top seller. This book has words that are directly from God. And we cannot level it out with the daily news. We cannot level it out with other materials out there. His word is different from that. Can you say amen? What this means, church, is when we open God's word, we're actually reading the very words of God. It's known as the breath of God. Hallelujah. Therefore, it is authoritative in our lives. It is not in the same level as any other material. It produces in us change. And the, the deficiency that I've seen in many times is this, that the body of Christ is malnourished because we have not been focusing on the Word of God. We're so full of activity, so full of different things. We have devotionals called one scripture reading. Sometimes not. God wants us to be focused on his word. The Bible says, his word I meditate day and night. The basics of the Christian walk. To trust in the Bible means to accept to accept its authority over our lives. And there are two things here. Number one, we have to receive the word of God. How many of us believe that? That when the word of God is taught to us, we have to have open ears to receive it. The Bible says, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, 
Paul is saying that they're the ones speaking, man spoke, but it was the actual word of God that was being spoken of. Are you with me? If it's the Bible, it's God who speaks. Can you say amen to that? If it is the Bible, if it is the word of God, it is not man who speaks, it is God who speaks. This is what we see in this passage. It, they did not consider it as words that come from man. This means that the hearing of God's word is vital to your life and to my life. Can I get more agreement on that, church? That our lives, if we want to hear God speak, we go to His Word. And sometimes, it is not just the reading of His Word, but the hearing of His Word that affects us. For the Bible says, for faith cometh by hearing. Faith is developed in us when we continually hear God's Word. As it is being preached, as it is being taught, we hear through our ears. But not only that, there's a second thing that we will see here. We accept the word it is as the word of God. Look at this. You accepted it not as human words, but as it actually is the word of God. Are you with me? When we hear God's word spoken from a man's lips... If it is from the very word of God, we have to listen and accept it as not from a human source. In, 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 it's true, it's a human being who speaks, but it is God who speaks through them. Amen? Amen? Scripture tells us that, that it's actually the word of God that they are speaking. And we are to accept it. So hearing comes through the ears. But accepting is a heart condition. Can you say amen? We can hear God's word, preach God's word. We can listen to many, many sermons or many, many things. We can listen to the audio Bible. But if we are not able to accept in our hearts, there is no change that happens in a human being's life. They remain the same as what they were from the beginning. Why? Because not only did it come in, it did not go to the heart it's so important as we believe in God's word that we consider his word not just like any other source of materials that we have out there we study God's word for what it is the very words of God hallelujah striking to note here that the, that the scripture says in verse 13, which is indeed at work in you who believe. What does the word of God do in you? It is at work in you. Can you say amen to that? What this means, church, is as we hear the word of God and we accept it and receive it in our hearts, what happens is this. This word begins to be at work. It changes us. It does something in us. It begins to mold us and change us. It begins to convict us of sin. It begins to draw us to an understanding that there is a holy God and a righteous God. No other material in this world does that. Why? Because it's the very word of God. When the word of God speaks to people, it does a work in them. Some of them got a special call that they go into the ministry. They choose that because it's just driving them. It's compelling them to serve the Lord full time. It causes them to give up everything. It causes some to go to other third world countries. It causes them to, to be, be grieved of sin when sin, is, uh, when sin is prevalent. Why? Because the word of God is at work in those who believe. It's working. It's changing. It's doing something in us. Hallelujah. It, prove, it causes things in us. Hallelujah. For those who believe. To those who do not believe, it's just another story. It's just another book out there. That's the same thing when we come and we worship God during praise and worship. 
It's not just singers singing and a band playing. It's the very presence of God that is being drawn through this. We call them ministers, not musicians. We call them ministers, not singers. Why? Because they are ministering to you. The very presence of God that is in them being passed over to each and every single one. That's why when it's time for worship, we feel the presence of God. It's not a, a concert with good musicians and good singers. It's the very presence of God. Every other musician band can do that. Good singers and good, good songs. But it is only the ministers of God who can lead in worship. Touches your heart. Hallelujah. Why? Why? Because God works through that. God works through His Word and changes us through His Word. Can you say amen? amen. Look at it, friends. Take the Bible, which is something that the book of Ephesians calls... He says, the Bible says, take you the sword of the Spirit. The only offensive weapon used for offense in the armory of the believer. Hello, church. The only weapon for combat. The only weapon to go against the power of darkness. That you have in your life is what is known as the sword of the spirit. Why? Because the other equipment, the other weaponry are for defense. We have the breastplate of righteousness that guards our heart. We have the helmet of salvation that guards our mind and our, our thoughts. Hello church. We have the belt of truth that is right there at the core center of our lives. We have the feet of the gospel so that as we continue serving God, we will not get tired. We have some kind of covering. We have the shield of faith. When the fiery darts come, we can go and, 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 and receive those arrows. And it will not hit us because there is what we call a shield of faith. But I'm talking here about the weapons of our offense. The weapons of our offense. What is that offensive weapon that is given to the believer? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is it? Is it the money that we have? Is it the education that we have? It is, is it the portfolio that you have? Is it the uh, influence of people that you have? Absolutely not. What is the weapon of your warfare? It is called the sword of the spirit, which is the very word of God. Hallelujah. So when we go against the enemy, we do battle against the enemy. What do you use for battle? The Word of God. Amen. Jesus modeled this for us. Every single thing that Jesus did when he was tempted, he referred back to something as it was written. Amen. Hallelujah. So when the enemy came and said, we're going to have a bread and basket ministry right here. You're hungry 40 days. You haven't eaten Turn the stone into bread and Jesus goes and says, For it is written, hallelujah, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. What does this mean, church? It's this, that we have to know God's word in order that when those attacks come, we can lift up the sword of the spirit and go and attack the enemy. Hallelujah. We need the power of God in our lives. So when those times come, we will not quote John 11.35. Hello? So when the enemy comes and, and says, man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, when, the, when the enemy comes and says, turn this stone into bread, we can't say, John 11.35, Jesus wept. <laughs> what do I mean, church, is this? We have to know the word of God. We can't just memorize the shortest scripture in all of the Bible. We have to meditate in God's word and know the scriptures in God's word. Hallelujah. And the word meditate 
in the original language, church, is seen in agricultural terms. You know what meditate is? How it looks like as it is written in the Old Testament? It looks like this. Many of us see, have seen an animal that goes and feeds and eats grass. But you know, in the heat of the day, that animal goes under the shade. Hello, church. And what that animal does, without grabbing any more grass from the ground, you can still see its mouth chewing. You can still see the cow or the goat still chewing. And they chew and they chew and they relish the taste of the grass that they just ate 30 an hour ago. 30 minutes to an hour ago, they're still chewing on it, meditating on it. They're still experiencing the power of that word that they read and memorized. They're chewing on it because they know that it's the power of God at work in their lives. So when we meditate, it's not just reading of a passage. It's putting it in our heart. It's letting it move in you, letting it speak in your life. It begins to do something in you. You're chewing on it. When you, when, you read, when you read Psalms 23, Oh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can spend a whole day just dwelling on that. And just chewing on that, that the Lord. Hallelujah. Whew. It changes you. Maybe you've read it a hundred times, maybe two hundred times. But even in those multiple Times of reading when you chew the cud. It's still fresh. Hallelujah. There's a danger church. Many times I've seen this a lot. I'm very watchful about this in my own personal life. This is how it goes. We try to look for a new experience. We try to look at the Bible and find, is there anything new that I haven't experienced? And sometimes we fall close to the boundaries of heresy because we try to look for something that isn't there. What we ought to do, church, is this. We try to make the old fresh. Hello? Don't be looking at the Bible and looking at something and saying, Lord, what is it outside of your word that you're trying to tell me? Just look at it for what it is. And you can walk in the middle of the road and not go down the heretic path. Go to the other side and go to the canal over here. You stay in the middle and put your focus on his word, the fundamentals of his word. Stay put in his word and you, what? you will be safe. How many people have we seen who have started looking for something that's outside of God's word? It's like looking for a new uh, coffee place. This is their restaurant. They've tried the cappuccino and the latte. They say, maybe the other place has something else. They look for something that they have not experienced. Let me say church. God's word is sufficient by itself. It does not need any additives. It's what changes us. That's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. His word is sufficient by itself to change us. That's why when we, when we talk about the sword of the spirit, hallelujah, which is the very words of God, we look at this and, and say, then what then is the word? So let's look at three things, three things that the Bible talks about the word. Number one is graphe. It is what we know as the written word. So when the Bible talks about the scriptures, it is the paper copy that is the graphe. That's the, what we call graphics in English. That's where we get it. It's actually paper form. It has no meaning. It has no value unless it's opened. Many of us have Bibles, but it's not opened. It remains to be grape. But we, some, some of us or most of us would love to open his word and study God's word from the book of Genesis until the end. We call that the Logos word. 
the message given. So we have graphe, the paper part. Hello? It's just like any other material out there. There's not, nothing divine about the paper. Hello? It's just like any other book out there. There are some people in other countries, they use the Bible to wrap cigarettes. Why? Because it's just paper. But if you look inside and begin to read, it becomes logos. And the logos is the message that is inside and it's written. Are you with me, church? Amen. But we, we read the Bible from the front to the end, and that's the logos of God, the written word of God. But many times when we go through circumstances, we need the word that is declared. We need the word that is spoken and uttered and prophesied. Hallelujah. Amen. Then we begin to go into the realm of Rema. The spoken and uttered word. And when Jesus was going through the temptations, when, when the devil told him to change the stone into bread, what did Jesus do? He did not quote John 11.35. He quoted the exact Rima word for that time and for that season. So when you go through times of troubles, you go through this different circumstances, you ask the Lord for that Rima word. It's the word that works for that time. Hallelujah. It's the word that speaks to you for the moment. It's the word of God that is spoken and declared. So when we go through times of poverty or problems, we say, Oh, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. What does that mean? That's the Rima word for that time. When we go through sickness, problems, we say to the Lord, we say to, to the enemy, You know what Rima is? We declare back. It's promises of God. Declared back to him. Declared to the enemy. Because why? The enemy could not stand his word. Are you with me? Hallelujah. We could say, by his stripes, I am healed. Why? Because it's in his word. Power of the Rima word. Spoken. Declared. For the season. For the time. Hallelujah. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's already here. The Bible says, For the word of God is alive and active. What does this mean? It's living. Not, not the, not the graphe. Hello? Not, not, not the paper part. But the content inside. Hallelujah. It's living and active. What it is like, have you ever seen a very sharp cutting tool? Hello? The word of God is sharper than that. The Bible says it is sharper than any double-edged sword. So it, it's not just one blade in the bottom. It can cut going in, it can cut going out, it can cut going down, it can cut going up. That means every part of you can be cut by His word. Hallelujah. The Bible continues on to say it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Why is this so important, church? We know passages in Scripture that says, For the flesh, uh, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit within man is looking for God. Wanting to serve God. But then we have the soul part. The personality, the emotional swings, ups and downs. Hello, church. That there are times when we wake up, we don't feel like it. It's different today. There are problems that come. There's sickness in the home. There's discouragement and disappointment, depression. Whatever it is, it's connected with the soul. Because the spirit looks for divine. Are you with me? 
And the Bible can come. The word of God is sharp. It can begin to differentiate. Okay, this is just the personality of the man. This is the emotional part of the man. Do you get over that? The, the, the spirit part. He's seeking after me. We cannot let the, the emotions, the, the problems of the past, the disappointments of the past, the emotional part, the personality of a person to stop you from seeking God. What God wants is this. He wants to have he wants to divide what is of the soul, what is of the spirit. So that when you come and serve God and when you come and worship God, it's not up, down. You remain stable. God wants you to do that. God's word does that. It convicts us of sin and, and, and things that we have in our personality. Not only that, it goes even to the physical realm. The bones and marrows, this is the innermost part. That's why sometimes when you hear God's word, it seems like, Lord, <sighs> touches us deep. Not shallow, but deep. It begins to work in us even, it feels like, to the bones. Something else here, church. Not only what you do, but it can also cut what you're thinking. Judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Not just what we do, even the mind and the heart. It's able to go that deep. That's the beauty of the word of God. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. So let's look at this church. You remember our chocolate milk. And the word of God, we, thought we said we were representing it as the energy drink. What does the word of God do? It separates what is of the spirit and what is of the flesh? Are you with me, church? We need God's word because God's word can teach us what to do and how to live and how to overcome. Can you say amen? How do we become victorious in our lives? We need God's word in order for that. Hallelujah. One thing that we need also, not just God's word, because many people say, I'll just stay home and study God's word by myself. By myself. Maybe if I just watch TV and watch someone preach, that's good. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm, that's all good. But you know, if you're just by yourself, even though you study God's word, you need community with you. You need other people with you. And by ourselves, what happens is we break. Right? But when we are with community and we study God's word together... Amen? What happens is we become together and knit together. We become a body of Christ that are built up together. And when you try to break when it's more than one, you cannot break it at all. So we need community as we study God's word. Because apart from community, we can have what we call heretical tendencies within ourselves. We need someone to guide us. Someone to help us in our understanding of God and His Word. We can't just live by ourselves and say we will study God's Word by ourselves. Many times we help each other through the breath of God, which purpose to train, rebuke, correct. Hallelujah. This is what God's Word does. Helps each one of us. We need one another then. Hallelujah. Because if we just stand by ourselves, yes, you're saved as an individual. That's not a question here. But we need community. We need to be together. We can't say, I will just stay by myself and alienate myself from the body of Christ. We need a church. We need one another. Because when terrible and hard times come, this is what matters. Yeah. 
There are people who will stand beside you and help you along the process. There are people who will guide you and strengthen you. When you go through difficult times, they can help you with the Rima word. Amen. Hallelujah. They can guide you in those moments of difficulty. What does that mean then, church? We need community. One thing about community is this. These people, they're not perfect. They're not perfect people. But remember, you're not perfect too. And the good thing with imperfect people together with a perfect God, amen, is that God helps us. God strengthens us. God keeps us from breaking. Because we are together in the power of God. Amen. Amen. Number two, to trust in the Bible means to accept opposition that it brings. Let me say this, church. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you will not be friends with everybody. There will be some who will say you are too extreme. Hello? That's what the Bible does. You, there is someone who said, I wish the church would be like the book of Acts, wherein everyone just sold everything that they had and gave to the poor, and they were just in unity together without any problems. Let me say this. Read the book of Acts. It's full of oppositions from other people. If you stand up for the solid foundation of God's word, you're not like everybody else. You will be different. Not that you hate people because that's not what you want. We're not people who dislike others. It's just that when you stand for God's word, you will find that you will not please everybody. The passage here that we're going to read in verse number 14. It says, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people. Now that's, I've studied this a little bit further. And when you look at this, it means not people that you don't know. It's the people that you do know. Who will sometimes disagree with you. They will say, oh, you know, we used to hang out together. We used to do things together. Now you hold the Bible and now you're different. We don't go to the same places that we used to go. Hello. You become an opposition to others. Apostle Paul is mentioning this. And he's saying that this is what's happening in his own life. When you serve God you will not please everyone. Let me share to you a true story because I have so many examples, but I want to share an example that is not connected with FIF. Amen? There's a man by the name of Jerry Bilotendos. Jerry attended a crusade in the town of Santa Catalina in the island of Negros Oriental in the Philippines. This is the place that... Uh, that he was at. The barangay, the barrio is called Manalungon. He came to a crusade one day. He got saved. Hallelujah. Met Jesus for the first time. And he loved Jesus so much. A young man. A, a, a teenager at that point. And Jerry wanted to share his new faith to everyone. He told his friends, he told his family, and he realized that they don't want to believe in his new faith. In fact, Jerry and his family were fishermen. His dad made sure that on Sundays they will go fishing so that Jerry will not be able to go to church. Early Sunday mornings, they would go out, both dad and son, they would... Um, go head out to the fishing areas where they would fish, drop their hooks, they would fish. 
And Jerry's mind would think, okay, it's like 10, 15, oh, praise and worship started already. This is real. This is what he told us. And then, oh, around this time, they would be collecting the offering. Wonder what the pastor's preaching now. They would catch fish. And, and he cannot go against his dad because his dad was his dad. And his dad would take him out fishing. His dad doesn't want him to this new faith that he has, this new relationship with Christ. His dad became an opposition to the Bible that he has received, to God that he has accepted as Lord and Savior. What did Jerry do? Later on, his dad said, Jerry, I want you to go out fish by yourself on Sundays. And Jerry wanted to honor his dad at the same time, wanted to go to church. And hear the message from the Bible that has convicted him and changed his life. So what Jerry would do is he would go and paddle out while his dad would be watching. Because the requirement of his dad is he needed to catch fish before he can come home. So Jerry would paddle out. He would go as far as he could so that dad could not see him from the shore. And he would start turning and make a big U-turn. And land by the shore around 100 yards from where the church met. And he would go to the church and attend church and listen to the messages of the pastor and receive the word of God for what it was. And then immediately after church, he would go back to his canoe and start paddling out and he would fish. And God gave him favor whenever he would go to church that way. He would catch more fish than when he won't. This is what he said. So true time, what happened, friends, is this. As he modeled the life that has changed him, this, this, this Jesus that has changed him, what happened was he began and he became a witness to his very own family. His dad became a Christian. Something that happened about Jerry is this. He went to Bible school. He finished Bible school. He went back to the same village called Manalungon. And he now pastors the church there together with his wife that came from the same Bible school that he was in. They serve God together in this local village. And now they are planting more churches around the mountains of Santa Catalina. What if Jerry gave up because of oppositions? What if he said, oh... This, is this really what Christianity is all about? I cannot please everyone. But Jerry now serves God and is, has been a blessing to other people as he has gone and served God. And now he serves God as a pastor. There's a risk of turning people away when we preach the conservative teachings of God's word without compromise. We cannot compromise His word and just preach what tickling ears would like to hear. We have to preach the totality of His word without any compromise. And I praise God for this church that has given me that opportunity to be able to do so. Without compromise. We teach God's word. At the same time, let me say this. Even though we teach God's word, that doesn't make us hating people. It actually makes us even love people more. Knowing where people would go if they don't have Jesus in their hearts. Are you with me, church, on this? Amen. I've heard some people within the congregation that would say, Pastor, I heard this comment. Someone told me, do you go to that church? And that was not a compliment when they would say those comments. What they meant was that church that stands for God and His Word. That church that can't be bent by the social winds of time. Is that the church that we would say this? I say, Lord, give us the grace. Amen? Because we all want to please everyone. But at the same time, there is one that we really want to please more. And that is God himself. Hallelujah. We want to serve God. And we want to be a blessing to the community. 
But God and His Word is still the priority that we teach. The totality of the Bible, not scriptures that we pick, but everything from the beginning to the end. And what happens is this. It's not a popular gospel. It's not a popular gospel. Amen. Number three. To trust in the Bible means to accept what happens to those who will not believe. Because sometimes we think that if they don't believe, they have their own faith. Maybe God will do something. They say, some, comment, uh, some people would say, all religions turn to God and then eventually everyone will be saved. The Bible, according to the scriptures, is a straight line. Amen? You know, it's like a narrow path. It's straight. And we follow God and His Word. And when God says that uh, in John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the truth. What that means is any other belief, any other diversion from that, which is not from God's Word, leads to Eternal damnation. And it has to be said that way. Are you with me, church? That's why we have to understand that we need to preach and teach God's word. Let's look at the, uh, verse number 15 and 16. The Bible says, Who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Keep on going against God and His word. We can't play with God. Let me say this, church. I grew up in church, raised in church, knew the Bible in church, but I played with God. And praise God, today, God has given me a second, third, fourth, fifth, 490 times, 70 times, 70, even beyond that. Hello? But we want to know that God, God's stuff, God's belief, God's teachings, God's ways are straight. We could not play with God. We could not go against God. We have to serve God. We have to be serious about God because this book is not just the newspaper of today. It's beyond that. It's the very word of God and we have to live out God's word in our lives. Now, if you notice in verse 15 and 16, these are the very people that were supposed to believe. Why? They were the Jews. This is what Apostle Paul said, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets. These are the people that were supposed to be knowledgeable. These were supposed to be the people who would accept the message. And what else did they do? They drove us out from Jerusalem. Next. What do we find? They displeased God and were hostile to everyone. And they kept others from knowing the truth. It's different. There are people who would say, I don't believe in that, but that's up to you if you want to believe. There are some like that. But let me say that there are actually, in this next slide, there are actually some people who would say, if you believe in that, that's okay for you. Uh, that, that, if you believe in that, I don't believe in that, but I also don't want you to believe in that. There are people out there like that. So when we have evangelistic meetings, what they would do is that they will stop you from doing evangelistic meetings even though they don't believe in God. Hello? How about saving the unborn? If you want to save the unborn, they say, I don't want to save the unborn and I don't want you to support saving of the unborn. They will go against you. Not only you, not only their own beliefs, but they will want to convince you to abort babies. They want to convince you that a homosexual lifestyle is okay. And it is not okay. Neighborhood church, 
If you want to say, I'll plant a new church in the community, what would they do? They would say, oh, let's look at the zoning laws. You can't really put a church here. They'll find every way in court so that your church will not be placed there. Yeah. Neighborhood church. How about prayer in school? They don't believe in prayer, but they don't want also others to pray and practice what they believe. They say, I don't pray, but I also don't want you and all the children to pray. Hello? Christian work atmosphere. Oh, you're a Christian? They don't eat with you. They segregate you at lunch. They don't want to talk to you. Why? Because it's not just that you are a Christian. They also want to convince everyone not to become a Christian. How about home Bible study? When many cars are parked in your home, someone would come and say, oh, they're holding Bible study? They'll call the homeowners association. And they will say, we need to stop this. They're holding Bible studies there. But when it's a party or a Halloween event or anything else, it's okay. They'll even invite their own kids to come and join. You know why, church? Because the community that we're in is so far from God. And we as God's people need to stand up, to stand strong, to love on others even though they don't like us. To stand for the word of God, to hold on to the covenants of God. Because why? This is what matters. This is what matters. We have seen through time that when the church wants to assimilate to the community, the community will not dislike them, but they will not also attend. That's what happens. A lot of times when churches say, oh, we want to be welcoming and do anything that the community does so that they can come into the church, they do that, what happens is this, they will still not come. Why? Because they have won. They have won. What the Bible wants us to do is to stay with the Word of God. To stand firm in the very words of God, despite of what happens. Amen? So on this next slide, why are we called a Bible-believing Christian? Is it because there are benefits of being a Christian? Is it because I meet, I meet new people at church? That's why I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I gather and see new folks and get the fellowship. Well, those are nice things. I'm not saying they're bad. But why are you a Christian? You are a Christian because you believe the very words of God that if we trust in Jesus, we are saved. We don't doubt that. That salvation is through faith. And where is it written? It is in His Word. And a lot of times, we, we divert, we open the package, we like the packaging, but we don't see the gift inside. We like to cover it up with so many different things, activities, uh, programs, stuff. Have you ever received a Christmas gift that the gift was so beautiful, the packaging was so pretty that you didn't open the gift? I have. It took me a few months before I actually opened it, and inside was this chocolate, the, the nutcracker gift. You know, it's, it's well-formed like a nutcracker. And the packaging is so pretty, so beautiful, but there's actually something inside. We can't be like that. We can't just adore the wrapping. We have to know why we are Christian. And that is because Jesus came and the source of material that we find that he came and saved us and gave us new hope is found in this book. Not just the grape, 
the paper part, but the logos, amen, the entirety of the book, hallelujah, the written word, the word that, the message that is for you, but it does not end there, it also speaks to you in the practical life of the 21st century, you can go and attack the works of the enemy, because you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, in your very hands. Go in power and in strength. Go and attack that enemy through his word. Watch, church, that in the armor of the believer, there is no back covering. You got breastplate, shield, belt, shoes, helmet. Turn your back, it's open. Why? Because God does not want you to turn around and run from the enemy. God wants you to pull out your sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Fight Him! Face on. The Bible actually says, stand your ground. And at the end, you will remain standing. Your weapons of the warfare are not of this world. Hallelujah. They're not carnal. They're meant to bring down strongholds. How do you do that? back to his word in closing as we all stand this morning